This was the cheapest NFID on amazon.com. And the question is, how does it perform? We're gonna take a look at it on the bench and then I'm gonna hook it up to a very, very compromised location and show you some contacts on FT8. Right now on Ham Radio, dude. This is a one to nine Bellin. I think it's supposed to be a nine to one on on. And here on Amazon, it's advertised as a mini Bellin capable of HF. And as if you know, random wire antennas, which this would be, would take a random length of wire in order to gain multiple bands on HF with a tuner. The cost of this at the time of recording is $14.99 from Amazon, and there are some in stock. The question is, is it any good? This is advertised as a QRP antenna or auto transformer, and yeah, yeah up to 100 watts on single sideband according to the specifications. It doesn't mention a digital spec, which you better bet we're going to test it. And for all you complaining, I always use my hands too much. You'll notice I haven't really used my hands much at all yet this episode. I assure you that will change. And of course, before we get started with the testing and experimenting, if you rather just read the review, uh, you click my Amazon link and go to the page where I've already left an Amazon review just for you. I was a bit too lazy to actually use the right tools to pry this open. However, if you had a flathead screwdriver, you could pry this open with a flathead screwdriver and there's two tabs on the SO239 side. Once you pop those tabs, we get a good look at the inside and here it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some stuff here we're going to talk about. And let's take a look here at, at this wing nut. And if we were to unscrew this wing nut or screw it in, you'll notice that it's a screw with a bunch of nuts and bolts and then a wing nut. But there's no lock washer. And so if we turn it one way or another, yeah, that screw inside twists as well. Sometimes it actually grips on that tab that has the solder point, which could be a problematic thing. So just be careful with that. Now, this post I'm turning on here is for the counter poise. It's just to be noted that we should have a counter poise on this. Typically, if we're running a short piece of coax, it's probably good to always have a piece of counter poise on there anyway. Now, this is the antenna right here. And the antenna has the same characteristics where when we turn, the screw turns. And you can see that the tab on this one actually turns with it. So you have to be careful because if you turn too much, you might damage that wire. Now, with all that, let's take a look at the SO239 and what happens if we turn this SO239 as if we were tightening coax. Well, if I'm tightening coax, you can see that that SO239 does have the potential to come loose. Now, the case itself will kind of hold that little nut that's on there in place because that nut is flat and it won't push up against the case, but it still will have some play in it, which then again, the whole toroid moves, as you can see here. Uh, kind of a bad design. There should have been a little notch in the circle that they drilled out, but instead they just drilled the hole to fit the SO239. Now you might need to rewind and take a look at that SO239 where the solder is attached from the toroid windings. And yeah, it's uh, very, very light on the solder. But anyway, if you turn the SO239, since it's so light, the potential for the solder is to break right there. Just keep that in mind in case your NFED random wire stops working. <laughs> now, what's this? Yeah, if you count these wrappings or these windings, there's only six of them. I think that would make this a uh, six to one un, un the way it's wrapped. And uh, that would be 300 ohms of impedance. So in between a 9 to 1 at 450 ohms and a 4 to 1 at 200 ohms, still should be a random wire and it still should work, which we're going to test out. I also want to mention that today I'm only really testing the functionality of this device and giving a overall review of it. In the future, we can go do radiation patterns. We can go compare it to a 9 to 1 or a 4 to 1 or even a 49 to 1. Hey, we can compare it to anything you want. If I take a look at the Amazon page and I go through the whole about this item and the specifications, there's actually really no indication of what type of toroid it is. And I, hey, I don't think that they probably even know, to be honest. But what I will tell you is uh, this toroid, it, well, it's never going to do <laughs> 100 watts on digital. I I'm surprised that it actually did in my testing 100 watts on single sideband. 
uh, for an hour doing parks on the air. However, uh, that wasn't being too aggressive on the actual toroid itself. I think I've mentioned it already, but I just kind of wanted to jump over here and talk about the wire that's going to go right here, our antenna wire. And it is a random length of wire, but I will link a website below that shows ideal, quote unquote, lengths of un un or nine to one random wires. And maybe that'll serve as a guide to be able to get just a little bit longer or a little bit shorter and, and find frequencies or, or lengths that'll work for you for the frequencies you desire. But what I will also say is typically a nine to one typically will require a tuner. And uh, that's not always the case if you find the right length. Again, check the website below. And then of course, we're gonna have that counterpoise on here too. Now, as I get this back together, so far, some of the positives that I see are it's small. It could fit in a pocket. It's lightweight. And even though the quality isn't the greatest, it is $15, which is a good starting point if you're not even sure you want to do HF in the first place. Now, you could always build one of these, and I completely understand that. However, if you're new into amateur radio... You might not have all this stuff laying around, and as time accumulates, you will start to get all this stuff laying around. And so I'm not going to be the guy to shame you for buying this over building one, although in the future I would recommend that maybe you try to build your own. This is a good starting point, though, as the quality is so poor on this that you would have to resolder everything, and you could actually kind of like build this up if you wish. We're gonna make the most compromised antenna that you could think of, and the nine to one is now in the attic. It's got a completely random length of wire on it, although I would assume it's about 50 some odd feet. It's got a counterpoise on it, and it has a choke on it right at the antenna, and then as the antenna feed line enters this room. With that, we're going to just kind of go through the bands here and see how this thing looks without a tuner. Is the standing wave ratio below 3 to 1 or not? Now, you remember random wire. Typically, you need to use a tuner. And uh, let's see how this looks here. That one's definitely above 3 to 1 on 160. Let's go to 80 meters. That's definitely above 3 to 1. And we're going to check and see if these could all tune up here in just a second. Let's jump up to... I'm going to skip 60. Let's go to 40. Looks like we see some FT8 on there already. Our standing wave ratio there is about 2 to 1. So we should be able to tune up on 40 without issue. Let's check 30. That's not 30. Okay, that's also high. Now we're going to go through each of the bands and we're going to run FT8. I'm going to tune up and then we're going to run FT8 with 100 watts because... This, well, actually, let's start with 50 watts. Let's go down to 40 first. Tuned up on 40 very easily. And actually, we're at 39 watts. We're going to call it 40 watts is where we're at here as far as checking to see how hot this can get. We know that it'll reach its saturation point, if you will when we start to see the standing wave ratio climbing, okay? After just a couple of calls, kind of where we're at as far as 40 meters goes, and we're being heard in a good pocket. It's about 11.30 a.m. in the middle of the summer here, so uh, I guess that would kind of be typical of what you might be heard on with 40 meters in the summer. Of course, it depends on your atmosphere conditions, and this isn't supposed to be a comparison of any other antenna. We can get to that at a later date, but I'm just kind of getting an idea how, if this performs at all, You can see I'm staying in that pocket, and I think that's kind of what we're going to see for 40 at this time of day. All right, FT8, 20 meters, let's do this. And I'm really impressed with being heard in Japan on 20 meters at 11.30 in the morning uh, during a solar storm. So that's kind of cool. Let's see, what did they hear me at? Negative 12. <laughs> And then I'm being heard in the Azores at negative 11. I'm not, I'm not upset about that by any means. Our standing wave ratio is completely fine. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, to be honest. That little toroid is, is holding up 40 watts. Let's push it and see how far we could actually get it to go. 
there's no way that this is going to do 100 watts on digital. No way. Hey, we're being heard in Alaska, which is kind of cool, right? KL7RA. Canada, Japan. All right. There's some check. Wow. Okay, Cyprus. Here we are. Okay, I think we're tuned up for 17 meters. And we're going to find a clear section of the frequency. Go to town. All right. Damn. Romania, Azores, Cyprus. 17 looks great. Yeah, let's try Romania. And uh, very low standing wave ratio. Uh, 80 watts. We're... Ah, 70 watts. We're going to go 70 watts because that's what I guess it was set to. And I think this is where we're going to start to see that, that core saturate and overheat. It's not like you can't do something like use 80 watts on one of these cores for a brief amount of time. However, the smaller the core gets, the less amount of time that you're likely to be able to use that, right? I'm hearing Africa. I'm hearing Europe. I'm hearing the U.S. But we really need to focus and concentrate on our standing wave ratio. Even with the tuner, there it is. You probably just saw that. The standing wave ratio just went through the roof after just like five transmissions at 70 watts. And just those few times that we've called on 17 meters, this is where we've been heard. And it's pretty much all into Europe and then the US uh, very slightly, but just only a few transmissions. Ah, we're being heard in Mexico too, that's kind of cool. We're back down to 40 watts now, and we're going to hope that we get this Germany station. So we'll see what happens here. Um, it looks like I'm being, or I'm hearing them at uh, negative 8, negative 6, negative 13. So Germany, we'll see what happens. I was a bit too late for that German response, and he probably left me. I purchased this NFED half, NFED random wire which is advertised as a nine to one, but it's really probably just a, a six to one on an, and a random wire thrown in a very compromised location, being the attic. I still was being heard what I would call around the world, all over Europe. I was hearing Africa. I was being heard in Japan. Stations in South America were trying to come back and make contact with me. The only problem I had is once I bumped this up from 40 watts on, on digital being FT8, to 70 watts, the core heated up real quick. And after the core heats up that quick, it's gonna take a while for it to cool down. In fact, it is still warm right now. So when I went back down to 40 watts, I wasn't able to make contacts because this thing would just start to heat up again and then again and again. Even after 30 minutes at 40 watts of power on multiple bands, I would say that after about an hour of 40 watts, you'd probably start to see that same core saturation. Uh, this is a very small toroid and you're not gonna find magical miracles that like oh hey this small thing somehow dissipates heat the smaller the toroid you're probably gonna see uh, the, the the core get hotter quicker or less power being able to be put out through that with that if you're just getting into ham radio and you're looking for your first HF antenna you're not sure you're gonna like ham radio and maybe you have a little bit of electronics expertise or experience or maybe you want to learn, then this actually might be kind of good for you. Why? Because it gets you into the game for $16, right? It's going to give you that opportunity to open this up, see what's inside, like we looked at on the bench, and also then kind of understand why sometimes it's good to avoid the cheapest anything. But then again, for $16, the minor repairs that I would have to make to it, even though it's not a nine to one, I still think it's kind of a cool little thing to have laying around and it's small enough to even just fit in my pocket. So with that, hey, I hope you enjoyed it. I don't have an opinion in either way. In the future, I'm gonna get out to the field. I'm gonna set this up. We're gonna try to find the perfect or the most ideal antenna length for this. And uh, we're gonna do radiation patterns and all that good jazz. That'll be a part two. And uh, I encourage you to maybe consider liking, subscribing so that you could be alerted when this video comes out in the future. Thanks a lot for watching the channel. I hope you enjoyed it. Check this out on Amazon. This channel is called Ham Radio Dude. I hope you have a great day. The dog's over there. What is it, Chucky? One like, one cookie, right? Give me that paw. <laughs> hope you have a good one. This channel, Ham Radio Dude 73.